We've heard a lot about change yesterday and it seems that many of us are going to be challenged by what's ahead. Excited and energised, I hope, as well. It's clear that we're going to need to think about the way we've been operating in the community sector. In fact, many of us have already been doing that and in some ways it's the government that's actually having to have change. As a sector, we're bigger than what you might think. Did you know that the community sector in Australia is bigger than agriculture, bigger than media, bigger than the car industry? Phil will explain far more about that very soon. If we really started flexing our mass muscles, imagine what we could do. But don't take my word for it, because we have with us today the key architect of one of the most authoritative reports on the size and dimensions of the community sector released in recent times. Phil Riven is the founder and chair of Ibis World, an international company providing online business information, forecasting and strategic services. In fact, ibisworld.com is rated as one of the most sophisticated and powerful industry and marketing websites in the world today. Phil also contributes regularly to radio, TV, newspapers, magazines, also on business and social issues. He's widely considered this country's most respected strategist and futurist. Again, we're lucky to get him uh, to, as a person as sophisticated as Phil without having to pay megabucks. In fact, he normally charges megabucks, but he's doing this free of charge for us today, so we owe him big time. Please make him welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. You're more than generous with that introduction, and uh, it truly is both an honour for me to be here and, uh, and also very happy uh, not, to, not to be charging, I can assure you, too. Um, can I just thank you in advance, Father Joe? I think you're, you're going to be fielding questions later on, so just be kind to me a bit, will you? Uh, when you come to that, I'm sure you will, as a man on the cloth. Um, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors and also uh, the exhibitors as well because I think they always make a conference like this uh, uh, m much better than it otherwise would be. And good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen of our community. Uh, well, what am I going to share with you uh, today? Well, a lot of statistics, uh, as Dennis has already suggested. And, um, and I should say in advance too that uh, I, I usually have a fair few slides. Uh, I try to keep them under 500 and we should be out of here by 10 past one. Uh, <laughs> But uh, in case I do move a little quickly, uh, you are very welcome to have a full copy of, uh, of these if the statistics or the patents or the trends uh, of any interest to you, either by uh, contacting us at Ibis World or uh, hopefully through our community secretariat as well. But what I want to share with you uh, today uh, are my thoughts on, on perhaps half a dozen areas. One is our new age social changes, and that's already been telegraphed to you in advance. Secondly, uh, a very short explanation of where our economy is and perhaps put it in perspective. Uh, and Dennis has already highlighted a few things about how big this sector is. And that will certainly take me into the third area, which is the not-for-profit sectors. How big is it? And I'm here to tell you too that we have since revised how big it is since uh, the notes that you would have had in, uh, you'd have received before this conference started. And it's, it's even bigger than we uh, suggested in our last report, and you'll see that it's a very, very big sector. I then want to talk about government priorities and ideologies, because we are moving through a very new set of ideologies these days compared to the old socialism versus capitalism ideologies that uh, were with us through the industrial age, and we've been out of the industrial age now since 1965, so we've been out of that for something like about 46 years, so what's the new ideologies? Um, and what that mean to us you know, in our community sectors. Then I want to talk about the need of change in uh, not-for-profits. And finally, what are the keys to success to running any good organisation today? Well, enough of that. And new age social changes. I thought I'd begin with a very upbeat slide because this slide goes all the way back to um, you know, the early 1800s. So we're looking at over 200 years history of Australia. And it's doing two things. It's first of all highlighting the ages of development that we've actually moved through as a society and as an economy, of course. Um, and secondly, it shows how our standard of living has been growing through those particular eras, if you like. 
very quickly, the eras we have moved, moved through, or the different ages, clearly uh, we were in the hunting and trapping age in the early part of that because uh, when uh, the European settlers came to Australia in 1788, there was an estimated 800,000 Aboriginals here and yet there was only 1,026 Europeans on the first fleet. So clearly the Aboriginal population uh, far outnumbered uh, the Europeans and in fact probably for the first 20 or 30 years the output of the Aboriginal population would have easily exceeded the output, the economic output of the, of the Europeans that were here, the rich. And, uh, and that's why I class that as the hunting and trapping age. And it was one of the last, of course, civilizations to still be in the hunting and trapping age in the early 1800s. There are a few, in, you know, obviously in places like Papua New Guinea and elsewhere, but of any large continent like Australia, we were one of the last you know, major areas of the world to be still in hunting and trapping. We then moved into the agrarian age, of course, which is dominated by agriculture and mining, but it's also an age famous, of course, for uh, the introduction of banking and things like that. We then moved into the industrial age, and you can see that the standard of living really began to climb during that industrial age, um, which finished around about the, the mid-1960s. And um, during that industrial age, of course, the most dominant industry, or well, the one that became the most dominant, was manufacturing followed by what we call the utility sector, which is electricity, gas and water, which was not only important to industry, but also very important to our homes. So that industrial age was a very, very exciting period, uh, not only for Australia, but for the rest of the world. Uh, we came into it perhaps uh, maybe 60 or 70 years later than England, but uh, nevertheless, when it did come, it certainly raised our standard of living. But then we entered a new age, which one of a better word these days, we could call the infotronics age mainly because since 1965, right up to the present time, and on to at least the year 2045, mm -hmm. we're in a, an 80-year period at least, which uh, is being dominated by information and electronics in one way or another, and you'll see that a little bit later on. And it's a very, very exciting age we're living in because you can see how fast our standard of living's been growing since we entered this new age in 1965. It, it's quite astonishing how fast we have actually moved. Um, uh, over that period of time, and, uh, and it's, it's by no means finished. Uh, now, there's going to be another new age starting probably in the late 2040s. Uh, I won't see it. <coughs> well, not in my first life. I'm coming back again, though. Uh, and, and don't disavow me of that, Father Joe, either, if you don't mind. Because um, uh, <coughs> I think it's going to be a very, very exciting new age. And I call it the Enlightenment Age. Now, that was often referred to as the Renaissance period, of course, too, as we know. But by Enlightenment, I mean we're going to be s receiving so much sophisticated help from the 2040s onwards from, um, from what you might almost call wise software and computers. Um, I mean, I'm a great fan of Star Wars and uh, I've always wanted to have my own private R2-D2 and CPO3s looking after me. Um, I mean, those, those fabulous little uh, robots, of course, kept Luke Skywalker alive because uh, he, was, he was a very lovable guy but had a very low, very low IQ, as you might recall, but uh, good looking. Um, or he played as if he had a low IQ. But he was kept alive by those two little, you know, very wise robots. And, uh, or, or electronic guardian angels, I'd call them too. And uh, that's what we're going to be seeing a lot more of as we move into the 2040s. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's one of those periods where, having got used to Google as we are now, uh, it's a question, you could ask questions, either the computer or whatever, like, is it true that um, you know, human beings are responsible for uh, global warming? And it'll come back instantaneously and say yes or no. You know, there'll be no mucking around. It'll have so much data and so much cleverness built into the system that you know, you, you'll be settling arguments very quickly. That won't please a lot of people uh, whose minds are already made up one way or another. But uh, nevertheless, that's the sort of thing we can expect you know, to emerge you know, by the second half of this century. Very, very exciting. But I'm here to tell you, as a final comment, <laughs> things are getting better, um, and uh, they're getting better economically, but it's people in this room that are trying to make it better in ways other than just money or the economy, and more about that later on as well. So, but things are improving. Now, we often hear about the good old days, and the older we get, the more we live by looking through rose-coloured glasses. But I'm here to say that um, I, I don't really quite believe uh, that they were the good old days uh, for reasons that uh, you can see there. And, um, uh, because when you go through a list of the things that, uh, in a sense, uh, people forget, first of all, we didn't live as long in those days, say 50 years ago. Uh, a man lived to 65, whereas today we can live to 78 or even 84 for a woman. 
we had two weeks holiday leave, now we've got four, plus we've got two weeks sick leave, which is the same as holidays for a lot of people, as we know, and we've got another... <laughs> And then we've got another two weeks, of course, of public holidays. So we, we, we don't work for two months of the year. Uh, we now only work for 10 months of the year, and that's if you're full time. Um, so, uh, you know, we're so much better off in terms of, of, of lower working hours in a year. There was no universal superannuation scheme back in those days. Uh, only half school people, uh, only half the population actually finished high school in 1960. Only half. Most of them finished, you know, in perhaps what you call. Uh, Year three it was a well, well, but it was the equivalent of uh, third year or fourth year in my days, um, and there was only fifty thousand students at universities. I mean, I graduated in nineteen sixty one. There were fifty thousand students across the whole of Australia. Now there's one point two million. That tells you how much you know more education and tertiary education we've had today. We had no black and white TV, and if we did, so we had only had black and white TV, and, and that would have cost us two thousand five hundred dollars in today's price terms. You know, for a seventeen inch black and white TV. In today's money terms, that would have cost us 2,500. There were no jet planes, no mobiles, no internet, no cable TV, no air conditioning. God, not many sewered homes either. Um, and there was no cures for cancer and there was, and, or any other serious health problems either for that matter. Wife bashing, rapes and pedophilia went unreported as we know. Um, there were no freeways. Um, there was only slow food, not fast food. Uh, you know, if you lined up at the fish and chip shop, it took you two hours. And, um, <laughs> Uh, everything was do-it-yourself. Uh, who could you outsource to? Um, and uh, whereas today, for example, uh, the average household today, and you might not believe this, the average household today in Australia spends $25,000 per household each year getting things done for them they used to do themselves back in, in 1960. You know, like you know, mowing the lawns, you know, washing the car, childminding, eating out. Uh, and people say, that can't possibly be right. But if you go down and sit around the table tonight and work out just how much you've outsourced that you used to do yourself in 1960, it's 25,000. That's more than the pension. Uh, it is astonishing. Um, and I'm helping that a lot because um, uh, <coughs> on weekends in particular, uh, I resort to sloth. Um, now, now, sloth is a very underrated virtue. Um, <laughs> uh, but sloth does so much good because what you're doing with sloth is outsourcing to people who haven't got a job. And that makes you feel very virtuous by the fact that you've now reduced the unemployment. Uh, so I, I think sloth, as I said, is a very underrated virtue. Um, it, pubs closed at six o'clock, and a lot of people might have been grateful for that, but they shouldn't have been because people used to order up at least five schooners just before six o'clock, uh, put them on the outside sill, and, and, and drink them until they were paralytic. Um, and, so, and then they went home, um, which was not a joy to see for the wives. Um, Shops were closed on Saturday afternoon, Sunday and public holidays, and we were all hung up and embarrassed by anything to do with sex, uh, whereas today at least we'll talk about it. So my point is, the good old days are now not then. That's what I'm trying to say. And I, I think we should therefore, in a sense, not only look at economic achievements over the last 50 years or so, but probably celebrate, a, 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 in a sense, a lot of social advance as well. Now that takes me into the changes that we're now passing through during this exciting new post-industrial age or the infotronics age. And I'm not going to go through all of these, it's ridiculous. I'll, I'll touch on a few of them in a bit more detail in a minute. But, uh, but the fact that we're living longer is, is, is pretty darn important, I must say. And um, uh, more of us are now living in coastal cities um, than ever before. Uh, there's more generations coexisting. Well, you could expect that because if we're living longer, there's room for many more generations to still be alive than there was, say, 50 or 100 years ago. I mean, if you went back 100 years, there was you, your parents, and maybe your grandparents, but that was it. You know, you never really live to see a great-grandparent, whereas today there can be up to five generations alive at the same time. And um, so there's an enormous number of changes that are taking place. Uh, people often bemoan the fact that perhaps there's less tribalism these days or neighbourhood-type uh, relationships that, we, that I grew up with for a start, but that's not quite true because tribalism is very alive and well today, but it doesn't happen to be geographic. I mean, it's, no, it's quite often that you don't even know your neighbour. You might think, God, that's terrible. But that doesn't mean you're not part of a tribe. It's just that your tribe's less localised these days. Your tribe could be your workmates. It could be your sporting friends. It could be a, a, a book reading club. It could be a whole lot of things. So I think tribalism's alive and well. It's certainly still alive and well with your immediate you know, blood relatives, of course, in most cases. Um, there's always a, a few problems there too. But 
Uh, don't ever believe that tribalism is disappearing just because the neighbourhood type tribalism has faded away, uh, even more so as we move into high-rise apartments. I think a tribalism is, is just re-emerging in a different way uh, and still works just fine. Um, but I'm not going to go through all of those except to say, look, there are a huge number of changes. The only one I perhaps should dwell on is the electronic guardian angels in the middle of the far right-hand side because I've already alluded to that. But um, we do have a society now that is protected more than it ever was. For example, if you're driving a car and you've got ABS brakes or, for that matter, the anti-skid things, then you're less likely to have a crash because there's a guardian angel you know, that's going to stop you from skidding into you know, the car in front of you if you brake too late. And that's what ABS brakes do for you. You go on around a curve too quickly, well, instead of wrapping yourself around a tree, it straightens your car out for you and, and applies the brakes and does all sorts of things to save you. If you're hard of hearing, you can have a you know, bionic ear looking after you. You could have a heart pacemaker in there. These are all electronic guardian angels. And um, uh, I, I grew up as a good Catholic, uh, believing there were two guardian angels per person. And I can remember at the age of five or six, I used to get up in the middle of the night sometimes, switch the light on to see if they were up the top of the wardrobe. But I never, I never found them. Uh, but I had to take my parents' word for it that they were there. Uh, what I am saying is we've now got electronic guardian angels looking after us every which way we can possibly think of, which is very, very exciting as well. But let me touch on a few of these. First, first of all, our population growth as part of social change in this new age. Um, and uh, that's population growth scares some people half to death. Um, and I don't think we should be because uh, here in Australia we're sitting on an amount of land that's nearly the same size as America. You know, it's almost 8 million square kilometres. Uh, and they've got something like 330 million people there, and we've only got 27 million, so we've got less than a tenth of their population. Our land is about the same size as China, and they've got 1.35 billion people. Uh, and uh, you know, that's a huge multiple of what we've got too. Now they've got more water than we've got. Uh, although we've got a lot of water, it's just it's where we don't live, because 60% of our water is up in the top one third of Australia, where only 3% of the population live. That's where all our water is. Um, so to suggest that Australia is getting a bit crowded with uh, 22 and a half million people is, is really flying in the face of almost what I'd call world morality, because I think that when we look at things like immigration, it should be judged against what our contribution is to our own immediate region, like the Asia Pacific, where half the world's population lives. Uh, and I, I really do see immigration as, as a, a as a moral issue, not so much an economic issue. And um, so I don't be surprised if we do have something getting close to 40 million people by the middle of the century, and maybe 70 million by the end of the century, and one day might be 100 million people. And I can hear the gasps sometimes. And if Tim Flannery was here, he'd have a heart attack. But, um, uh, but seriously, um, people often confuse the number of people with what they do. If you're going to destroy your own environment, you can do it with far less people than we've got today. You've only got to look at the desalination problems or the salination problems we've had out in the bush and a whole lot of other things where we've, we, you know, we clear felled too much of the forests and all the rest of it. We did that with half the population we've got today. So it's not really the number of people that cause a problem, it's what those people do and how they live. And we are considered a very dirty country at the moment in terms of how we produce our electricity because we do too much with black coal, which is a very dirty energy producer. So. Uh, there's many ways to reform the way you run your economy and society to accommodate a lot of people without uh, overly damaging the environment. So uh, as I come back to saying, I think the population of Australia is more of a moral issue than it is an economic one. And if we are truly global citizens these days, or at least Asia Pacific citizens, I think we have to look at our particular population in relation to the Asia Pacific, rather than look at it in some sort of narrow, selfish uh, attitude by saying that we discovered it, bugger off. Um, you can't say that. I don't think that's the right attitude to take. Enough of that. We are moving away from the bush, and that, that chart reminds us that it wasn't that long ago, like 100 years ago, when most Australians lived in the rural areas. That's the green area in 1901. And today, as you can see, we're down way less than 20% of the population lives in the bush. And that includes our bush cities, you know, whether it be Wagga Wagga or whether it be Ballarat, Bendigo, um, Tamworth, whatever. Uh, all of those are in that green area. And you can see that we've really decided we want to live by the coast and in capital cities. And by the middle of this century, that's even more so. So uh, our growth is taking place 
on the coast of Australia. And of course, all of our capital cities except Canberra are on the coast as well. So you can see how much coastal hugging is going on with our society. And it will probably stay that way for most of the century before we start to move back into the bush again in the 21st century. Um, our largest cities, you can see how urbanised Australia is because you look at uh, our top 20 cities and you realise that you've looked at, uh, at, at some enorm enormous proportion, of course, of, uh, of the Australian population. We are a very urbanised society and becoming more so. Mind you, so is the world. The world is becoming a much more urbanised place, but we're way, way ahead of the rest of the pack too with, uh, with our bigger cities. It's interesting too that Sydney and Melbourne, and for that matter Brisbane, are all in the top 20 most livable cities of the world. And we should feel a little bit happy about that because if you look at the 20 largest, sorry, the 20 best livable cities in the world, the average population of the most livable cities in the world is 1.4 million people. And yet you look at Sydney with 5 million people or Melbourne with 4.5 million people, we must be doing something pretty right to have two very big popular cities like that in, in the top 20. So. Uh, uh, we can probably take a bow there in the sense that somehow we haven't really made it uh, as big a mess as, say, Chicago or New York or, some, or, or if you like, London, none of whom ever uh, make, of course, the most livable cities. Vancouver is usually the city that ranks first in the world and it's, of course, a quite beautiful city too. But there is a population that's much, much smaller than anything we've got here. So anyway, that's our cities. Um, this is my favourite slide. It's called Living Longer. Um, and I keep that beside my bed every night um, just to cheer me up. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but, but it is an interesting slide because it takes us back to the early 1800s again, reminding us that the average life expectancy both for men and women in the year 1800 was 38 years of age, which explains why there wasn't much divorce in those days. Uh, <laughs> there just wasn't time. And um, by the time you wondered whether the marriage was working or not, it was too late, you carked it and went to God. And, um, <laughs> Whereas these days, you know, living to 78 or 84 as a woman, you've got a chance to do a trade-in, uh, if you like, and, uh, and many of those do take place, and it's usually the women, now that they've got some power, are doing the trading in of us blokes. And fair enough, we ran the joint for 11,000 years, it's your turn. Um, and, uh, but the other interesting thing while I'm at it is that people think that marriages don't last as long anymore and that divorce is climbing. Neither of those things are true. Uh, what's not very well known is that the average length of a marriage has never changed in the last 250 years, either in England or here. It has been 20 years. It has never, ever got less than that. In fact, if anything, it's creeping up a bit, going up. Why? Well, mainly because uh, people live together before they get married. Uh, sort of try before you buy. And uh, I don't mean that in a sexual connotation. I simply mean, can you live with their really annoying habits? Um, uh, and if you can adjust to that, then when you do get married, there's no surprises. And that's one of the reasons why I think there's less divorce. The other interesting thing about divorce is that if you're going to have a divorce, it used to take place around about seven and a half to eight years into your marriage. Now it starts around about 12 years into your marriage. So uh, don't, be, don't be misled by anything that ever says to you that marriages don't last long or divorce is common. It's not. In fact, we haven't had as many divorces as we had in 1976 ever since. We've now gone for something like about 35 years and we've never ever reached that level of divorce that we had then, which of course is when uh, Senator Murphy of course brought in the, uh, the, the no-fault divorce law, but, um, but there were 76,000 divorces that year I think in, in 1976 as well, or 72,000, something like that. We've never reached that number since and that's a long time ago. So if you like, uh, marriage is rocky as it is, uh, is as stable as it's ever been and more so. Composition of households, well, um, you can see that we don't have very many big families anymore. Uh, you know, having six or more in the family, like mine, mine was, because there were six children, and in my family, that's pretty rare these days, you can see. But the main reason is we found out what's caused it since then, and now we know what to do about it. And um, <laughs> they had no bloody idea 50 years ago what was happening, and uh, uh, now they know, now we all know. Um, but you can also see in that chart, you know, how many homes there are with just one person in them. You know, that's that red area up the top. Um, now you might say, oh my God, that's becoming a very, very lonely society. Uh, and it might be if it hadn't been uh, for the advent of, uh, if you like, uh, the internet and emails and all the rest of it, because uh, in a sense, we don't have to be as lonely. What's coming through very quickly too is things like televisioning, as they call it, which is even better than Skype. Televisioning will be pretty common amongst all households within the next 10 or 15 years, which means that you almost feel as if you can reach out and touch and shake hands with the person you're talking to. And uh, 
So you, you don't have to necessarily be as lonely as that chart might suggest uh, at all. And certainly in terms of health, for, certainly for the elderly people, I mean, the advances that are going to take place with electronics uh, means that you are never going to be far away from, from a carer or from help or an ambulance or whatever it might well be. So uh, as I say, that chart might look like we're getting more lonely. Um, I mean, if you add to the next level down, which is where there are two people, uh, that's the yellow area, you can say, my God, there's only one or two people, you know, in more than half the homes of Australia. But, um, uh, but even two people can be close together. I mean, all my kids have grown up, so my beloved and I go through a lot of what you call companionable silences. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a delightful term, you know. Um, and uh, so, that, but, but being together is very nice. Uh, but you don't have to be yak, yak, yak all the time at, at all, you see. Enough of that. Uh, age distribution, yes, we, we are getting older. There's no question about that. The average age, in fact, is, the average age, if we went back to the 1860s, uh, was, was 22 years of age. That was the average age. Uh, by, by the year 2050, which is the middle of the century, the average age would be 42. It's almost double. And by the year, perhaps 2100, the average age is going to be close to 50. That'll be the average age. But by then, we're getting close to averaging a life expectancy of nearly 100. So it's going to be, everything is relative. And, and the point I'd make about an ageing society is you've got to keep redefining what the, world old, what the word old means. You see, because in 1800, when we lived to 38, at the age of 65, you'd been dead for 28 years, you see. Uh, and even by uh, the year 1900, when the average life was 53 years, you'd been dead for 12. So the retirement age of 65 was ridiculous. And in the year 2000, and, uh, or the year 2000, because the average age was up around, as I say, 75, 76, so that you still had about 11 or 12 years to go after 65. So you've got to keep re re redefining what the word old is. And um, uh, I don't think people will be retiring much before the age of 75 at the end of this century and enjoying it, probably part-time rather than full-time, uh, because we now live in an age where the work is not physical. There's only about 4 or 5% of the entire workforce would be into what you call hard physical work. Most of us are into cerebral work using our brain and, and our hearts in your case too, but um, uh, the only way to wear out your brain is not to use it. Um, so the thought of retiring at 65 if you're going to die at 100 is ridiculous. Why would you be retired for 35 years? Uh, it just, just doesn't just make sense. And the same with the workforce. You're going to see that more and more people are going to be working later in life, as that chart suggests, uh, compared to going back to, say, the beginning of the last century in the early 1900s. Um, and there's fewer and fewer younger workers because they're staying on at university and becoming more and more learned before they enter the workforce. The other interesting thing, though, about work, which most of us wouldn't know, is that the average amount of work done in a lifetime, it's a bit like marriage, has never changed. It's always been 80,000 hours. In the year 1800, we all worked 80,000 hours before we, we quit, either died or, or, or retired. The difference is, in those days, since you only lived at 38, most people started work at the age of 13, and in the remaining 25 years of their life, they had to work a 65-hour week. Today, we don't work for 25 years, we work for 50 years. But we only work for half as many hours each year, and I've already explained we have two months off each year anyway for a start, and for the other 10 months we don't work anything like a 65-hour week. So it is still 80,000 hours of work today as it was 200 years ago or more. And another 100 years' time, it'll still be 80,000 hours, except we might be working for 60 years, but less hours each year. So uh, some things remain remarkably constant. Um, how many generations? This is so terribly important as well. As I said earlier, if you went back 50 or 100 years, there wasn't much, th there weren't that many generations alive at the same time, because we didn't live as long. But now you can see how many different generations we've got. I mean, starting up there uh, in the little narrow sliver of yellow is what we call the Federation generation. They go back a long way. Then comes my generation, uh, what we call the silence, uh, for whatever better term. And um, uh, we're anybody aged between 68 and um, 85. Then come the baby boomers, or as their grandparents used to call them, the spoilt rottens. Um, and they're 45 down to 67. Um, they hate that term, spoilt rottens. But, um, uh, and they probably weren't really, but that's what their grandparents thought, because they were given so much so early in life. Then come the Gen Xs, which my best mate calls the Angoras, or are used to, meaning lovely, cuddly and useless. Um, and uh, <laughs> he, he, he has since apologised for that. He, he made that call much too early. Um, 
and he found out that he had mistaken uh, the fact that they were fairly quiet for meaning that they weren't going to achieve very much, but he got that dead wrong. They were quiet because when you've got baby boomer parents, you can't get a word in edgewise anyway. And uh, uh, they've turned out to be the smartest generation and probably the best managers uh, we've seen for over 50 years. Uh, if you wonder why the profitability of companies is rising so well back up towards world's best practice, it's because the Gen Xs have been taking out the top jobs and they are quiet achievers. They are an absolutely brilliant uh, generation. They're aged between 29 and 44. Then come the net generation, or the ferals as I call them. Um, and, now, not because they're wild animals, uh, which they all are until they're seven, but um, no, I'm joking, but uh, they're ferals because they are totally unconstrained by time, space and distance. They truly are world children. I mean, they're born with a mobile phone hanging off each year and a, and a PC in their lap. You know, they're onto Google. Uh, I had one of my grandchildren staying with me whilst his folks and the rest of his siblings were in America. And, you know, it, he was into the Google long before I was. He'd ask a question, which is a silly question, like, who was that actor back in 1957, you know, in that movie? I mean, he wasn't even born. But, you know, uh, he'd come back to me within 12 seconds, you know, having gone to Google. Oh, you mean James Cagney? Yeah, how'd you know that, you know? Uh, you know, they're just so smart these days, or they're so knowledgeable. Maybe smart's too, too generous, but by God, they know they know 50 times more stuff uh, than I ever knew at that age, too. Uh, they're going to turn out OK. How the hell do you keep them at, in your workforce? I'm, I'm damned if I know. Um, because they're very peripatetic. They want to move. And uh, uh, if you can hold on for more than three years, you know, take, take a bow. Cause, uh, but I tell you what, if you can harness the energy and the knowledge of that net generation, they will achieve twice as much in a day than any other generation I've ever seen. They are absolutely unbelievable. So you can never read the next generation short. OK, they're not going to get married until they're into their 30s, which is why they seem to be sometimes irresponsible and peripatetic, but uh, they're going to live much longer anyway, so they're allowed to be silly for longer uh, in, in terms of what they do with their lives. But they are a very, very knowledgeable, smart generation. And then the last one is the millennials, the ones born after the year 2000, and I have no idea what they're going to be like either at this stage. But uh, I say that because, I mean, many in our community are looking after those who look after the elderly, um, you know, the silence, my generation, the older ones, are going to cop the baby boomers, uh, you know, in the not too distant future as well. And it's interesting to see how generations are changing in terms of what they represent to the community, what they need, what they want, uh, how they feel, and having a respect for each generation for what they are, uh, I think is one of the great things we have to, uh, have to adapt to. What about incomes? Well, the average family, it might surprise you to know this year, will earn $130,000. Now you think, crikey, uh, that usually surprises the blokes more than the women because they never count their wives' income into the equation. They just think they're the only breadwinner. Well, that used to be the case, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, these days, often it's the woman's earning more than the guy. And, um, but no, the average household income is $130,000. When you think there are many pensioners on $22,000 or $23,000, and there are many, a lot fewer families that are earning probably 10 million or more, you can see that averages really don't tell you very much at all. In fact, the median income, you know, where it peaks is, is probably near at about $95,000, but it's still a lot more than we used to have. And you can see that how it's growing, and that's, um, that's been graphed um, all the way back to the, the mid-1980s. Uh, uh, um, and I've made a guess as to where it might be by the year 2040. Why do I do that? Only because I think for retirees in the future, to be able to retire on about a third of the average household income is about what I think would be a nice objective to have, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. So uh, these days, if you want to retire on a third of the average family income, you'd want to be able to retire on about $43,000 a year, or nearly twice the pension. Now, there's not many are capable of doing that because we've not really been very good savers uh, in the past. Thank God for superannuation, and I had that climb from 9% to 12 to 15 over the next uh, decade. So, because if we get it up to 15%, uh, the superannuation, we'll all retire on at least a third of our last year's annual income or the average income. And that means we'll retire with dignity, be able to take the odd trip abroad if we need to, buy a new car every five years, which a lot of people can't do at the present time. So. Uh, uh, in a sense, um, the challenge of retiring with dignity is going to be one of the great challenges uh, going forward over the next few decades. This is how we spend our money, which of course is easily. Um, we know how to spend it all right. And the reason I said a third of that income would probably be great for retirement is that a lot of things don't happen once you've retired. You're not paying off your house, all that light blue area called capital related expenses, which is paying off your home, both principal and interest. Uh, your taxes are almost non-existent at that time. And when you start taking off the things that you're not going to be stuck with, even, including rent even, um, 
then uh, you can see that earning about a third of the average uh, household income is very good and that's a goal I think we should aim for. Um, and the way we spend our money has changed dramatically over the last 100 years or more. As you can see in that light green area, uh, back in the early 1900s you'd have found that uh, you know, almost two thirds of your, uh, of your total income went on buying things from a shop, food, clothing, tobacco, alcohol, newspapers and all the rest of it. These days that green area is quite small, in fact it's, it's around about a quarter of what we spend our money on. These days the average household spends most of their money on services one way or another. Mind you, taxes are also higher, but they, um, uh, they also go into services as well. The only reason that pink area is shrinking a bit is because we introduced the GST, as you may know, back in the year 2000, uh, which meant that a lot of the taxes are hidden in the, in the items below that. In other words, the pink area is your direct taxes coming out of your pay or out of your profits if you're a company. So don't think that our taxes are, are becoming less, it's just that they're being um, hidden a bit more. But they nevertheless are more than they were 100 years ago and that's a very civilising thing to do because we are able then to distribute more fairly the services that make a community uh, have more integrity. I'm going to talk about our economy very briefly now. Uh, first of all, to ask the question, how do we feel about how the economy's going? And we've been doing this question or this survey now, when I say we, it's been the Melbourne Institute uh, since 1973. And, and all the countries around the world do this. Um, and uh, you can see that we're more happy than sad because anything in blue means that more than half the population are very happy about what the next year is going to hold. If you're in the red area, it means that more than half the population thinks that the world's going to be bad next year. Now, they're usually more miserable than they need to be because you've actually got to drop below 80 points on that chart before you get a recession. And we've not been able to manage to do that since 1991. We've tried a few times but failed. And, um, uh, but you can see we had a couple of recessions back then, 91, also back in 82, 83. Um, if you look at America on that chart, and I'm not going to do that, uh, they are much more volatile. They rise to much greater heights than that, but not very often. And they slump down into despair more than we do. Um, and if I showed you the British chart, which I haven't, there's hardly any blue on it at all. In fact, the, the, the Brits in the last 35 years have only been happy for five years. Um, <laughs> And uh, they're the most miserable poor buggers on earth. And, uh, and uh, those five times they were happy, it was interesting, it's when the Falkland War started, which was very exciting for them at the time. Uh, it's when they had a very hot summer back in 1976. It's the first time they'd had a hot summer in their, in their lifetime. Uh, they also held the European soccer final, I think, in 1980-something or other. Um, and they got the ashes back in 2005. They're the only four or five times they've been happy. Uh, I don't know how to make a POM happy, uh, unless they migrate. There's probably quite a few of you in the room that are ha happier than you could have ever imagined by coming out here in the first place. But you can see that we are, thank God here in Australia, happier more often than we are miserable. At the moment, we're pretty damned happy, and that's nice. Now, this chart then tells us what's actually been happening to the economy over that period of time. And you can see we've only had a couple of recessions, so that we get nervous for no good reason. Um, the newspapers often do that, particularly the tabloids. Um, the light blue area is where I think the economy's going over the next five years, and so I'm not seeing any trouble with the economy over the next five years at all. The dotted lines you can see there are what you call long business cycles, and they average eight and a half years for reasons none of us know why. Um, but all we do know is you can't have a recession at the, except the end of, at the end of each cycle. Um, you just can't, uh, no matter how stupid the government is. And, um, <laughs> and the other good news is you don't have to have a recession if you don't want one at the end of eight and a half years. And we've chosen not to have one in the last two uh, uh, downturns at all. And you might think, uh, well, what causes recessions? Well, I'm here to tell you it's not the consumer. People often think, oh, you know, people you know, sew up their wallets and their purses and their credit cards and won't use them. That's not true. There's never been a year in my life where the consumer spent less in one year than the year before. That has never, ever happened. So families and households have never, ever, in my lifetime, ever caused a recession. Uh, it's the one quarter of the economy that is spent on capital expenditure by businesses that cause recession because they hit the panic buttons and cancel projects and cancel the capital expenditure. That's what's always caused a recession. So as long as you can actually stop companies panicking, you literally stop recessions. Now, the reason we could stop them in the future is that there's not enough women on the boards at the present time. There's only 11% of the board's directors have got a woman on them. Mind you, how the hell we let it get that high, I don't know. But um, no, I'm joking, I, I truly am joking. Um, 
I think we should have at least 40% of the boards of directors being women, and I truly mean that, because they are less nervous than blokes, and uh, they would stabilise the investment program of corporations, and we might then never have a recession the rest of our lives. But at the moment, we've been pretty good uh, over the last 20 years. This is where we are employed these days by the economy, and you can see very few people are employed by the farming industry or by the mining industry, even though the mining industry is a pretty big industry in output, but there's you know, only about one half percent of the entire workforce is in mining. You can see very few people in manufacturing these days, and yet it used to be over 30% back in 1960. Most of us are employed in the service industries, either the commercial industries like retailing, wholesaling and transport, that's the yellow area, or we're in what you might call the, the, the knowledge or finance sectors, which are in green, or they're in the blue area, which is really, if you like, your household services and personal services area. We have very much a services economy these days, uh, as is the entire world. More about that later. Let me now go into the not-for-profit sectors, if I may. And um, this is where I think uh, our Chairman Dennis has suggested that uh, we put some pretty big numbers up, and I will over the next few slides. But I think, first of all, it's, it is a much bigger sector than I think most people do realise. And um, as you can see there, uh, if you can read it, because I'll need my notes to read it, um, the not-for-profit sector, of all the enterprises in Australia, and there are something like over 1.6 million of them, almost 3% of all of the companies in Australia or businesses are in the not-for-profit sector. Over 3% of all the outlets or branches, if you like, that those businesses have are also not-for-profit. It, it accounts for 5.7% of our entire nation's revenue. It accounts for nearly 10% of the entire economy, uh, measured by what we call value-added. Uh, in other words, it's 9.6%. You can say it's a tenth almost of our economy, but it's growing at least half a percent faster each year than our GDP. So you are a growing sector as well as being big. You've got 14.5% of the nation's workforce. That's a seventh. That's pretty damn substantial. And you account for a little bit more than that in, in terms of the wages. Um, because many of the service industries earn more money than the goods industries. Um, in the next chart, we're looking at how big the sector is, or the overall industry by sector. And uh, what I've done there, and I'm not, I don't want to dwell on this because you can have a look at this if it's of any industry or you want to quote it uh, when you're making uh, either comments, talks, or, or applications to government or whatever. But um, as you can see there, the total revenue, and it's bigger than what was given to you in the handouts. Um, or in the, the pre-publicity, but uh, we rate in this year, 2011, the revenue of all the not-for-profit sector is 204.7 or $205 billion. That's a big, big sector. Um, that's three times bigger than agriculture, at least, maybe four. Um, and uh, it's bigger, I might add, than mining, which is about $180 billion. Um, it's bigger than a lot of sectors when you add them all up. And you can see that education is the biggest, followed by health and community services, miscellaneous services, which I'll come to in a moment and explain what that is, the hospitality sector, the cultural and recreational sector, and that includes sporting associations, all sorts of things as well, the research sector, mainly things like um, uh, health research and other things, and volunteerism. Now, volunteerism has had to be imputed because it's not counted in the economy, but the Bureau of Statistics does do surveys every now and again. And the, uh, the employment of volunteers is equivalent to 140,000 employees. The actual number is about just over 2 million volunteers in Australia this year, just 2.05 million. And that's shown at the very bottom of that chart, and you might find it hard to read from where you are. But if you convert the part-time volunteerism into the equivalent of a, of a full-time worker, uh, it comes up to about 140,000 equivalent. So. Uh, that means that we've got, in equivalent terms, over 1.6 million workers in the not-for-profit sector. Um, so that's just to get some very, very quick perspective. Uh, if we look at which are the biggest sectors you know, on this pie gram in revenue terms, and I'll show you the same in employment in a moment, you can see that education is number one, as I've said, health is number two, community services is number three, and in there, and in that light blue area, uh, is uh, things like religion, which is 1.2%, um, so to a cha uh, sorry no, it's uh, charities, sorry, in that light blue area. I want to dwell on charities for a moment because they account for about just under 5% of the entire not-for-profit uh, industry of Australia. Now, and it's turning over, you know, upwards of around about um, nearly $9 billion a year, I think. But the only thing I find fascinating about charities uh, is that they 
represent a much smaller proportion of the do good work today compared to 100 years ago for a very good reason. If you went back 100 years ago, perhaps 110 years ago, um, most of the charity done was you know, by churches to some extent, a little bit by police stations and things like that. But what's happened is that by taxing Australians more and more over the last 100 years, we've actually institutionalised a lot of charity which has been a very civilising thing in society. Because our taxes now pay the dole, they pay you know, for family benefits, they pay for education, a whole raft of things that had to be done you know, through the charity and philanthropy uh, industry, if you like, 110 years ago. So these days, the charities we've got do about 5% of the charity work that was done 110 years ago. And we should cheer that because, as I say, we've almost institutionalised a charity into the tax system so that we we don't have to have cap in hand you know people looking for help for things that we now provide through the tax system so I find that very helpful what we do know about charities today uh, is that they are the ones that are picking up really those that get left behind by governments or by society and by God do we need that more about that uh, later on so that's just to give you some perspective on, on where the not-for-profit sectors are. If we do it by employment terms rather than revenue, it's not a great deal difference, as you can see there, too. And again, I'll leave that to your own leisure if you want to have a look at it further on. I now want to talk very briefly about government priorities and ideologies, too. And um, the first thing is our national government, uh, which collects most of the taxes and spends most of the money, either directly or through our state governments and our local governments, um, you can see there that uh, where if you like, the federal budget goes uh, uh, each year. In this case, it's the budget for this coming year. They're aiming to spend $366 billion. Uh, the biggest single amount will go into social security and welfare. Then general government services will take up an awful lot, which is the, the public service. Health will take up uh, a huge chunk too, the 16%. And you can see that, well, you can't see it, but health is actually growing faster and getting a bigger slice of that pie than education and the squeeze that's been going on universities and others is a direct result that society seems to be screaming out for more health than education. I mean, we want everything, but we can't do everything, and it seems to be that health's getting a, a bit more of the share. Uh, in terms of paying or running a balanced budget or not, uh, if you go back over the last 50-odd uh, years, you can see that um, there are periods when we seem to run massive deficits and then periods when we run pretty healthy surpluses. Um, it's an oversimplification, but usually the coalition runs the surpluses and the ALP runs the deficits. Uh, there's some slight exceptions to that. And nothing's much changed over the last 110 years in that regard. Um, and uh, it's interesting, we do need uh, both the humanistic style of governments, but we also need the hard-nosed practical ones as well, otherwise we'll end up as a Cuba. Um, and that leads me to what ideologies are changing. Because if we went back to the industrial age, which finished in 1965, the big fight was between the left and the right, or if you like, between the socialists and the capitalists. And um, uh, that fight went on, and still goes on to some extent, although that fight's basically finished, because capitalism and socialism pretty well began to uh, arrive at a compromise uh, in the mid to late 60s as the industrial age was finishing. And the socialists gave up the idea that uh, government should own all the means of production. And that was what they had originally wanted to do. They didn't want private sector to own any, any damn fool thing. They didn't trust them. Well, they gave up on that idea. Um, but the capitalists also gave up on the idea that they should uh, you know, keep all the profits to themselves. And in other words, they began to surrender more of their profits into the tax system to create a fairer society. So we ended up with socialists giving up the idea of owning everything and the capitalists uh, giving up the idea of keeping everything to themselves. And that's, that's pretty well finished as a fight today. And so the new fight, starting in the late 60s and going right through to the middle of the century, is going to be rationalism versus humanism. And uh, what's interesting is that if you look at the last uh, that period when, if you like, capitalism and socialism were fighting, the so-called capitalists, which I suppose you'd call the Liberal Country Party type coalition, they ran the government for 70% of the time, and the ALP, which loosely called the socialists, ran it for 30% of the time. If it had been any different to that, we'd be broke. Um, in other words, you've got to have you know, the progressive changes brought in by the socialists, and we did, uh, but you've got to have uh, real practicality when it comes to running the nation and, and you know, with balanced budgets. 
it's going to be the same during this period right up to the middle of the century too. The rationalists will probably run the country for about 70% of the time and the humanists for about 30%. If it's any different to that, we'll be broke. Um, because, uh, but you need a healthy balance. Um, and that might hurt you a bit, but I can tell you if the humanists ran it, uh, we'd be in all sorts of bother. Now the question is, what sort of governments have we had recently, where do they fit? Well, the interesting, the Hawke and Keating governments were up in the rationalist area. They'd almost left socialism behind, did all those reforms, and got really rational. So did the Howard government, but uh, they did it without much of a, a, a heart towards the end, and that's why everybody, a lot of people don't like Howard and think he was an evil man, all sorts of things. Well, as it turns out, funny enough, Howard was one of the best prime ministers we've ever had. Uh, because if you go and look at all their best prime ministers or leaders over the last 200 years, you'd find that half the people hated, the, hated them, really hated them, but they happened to run a very good economy. But anyway, both the Hawke government and the Howard government were both rationalists. The Gillard government's clearly down near the humanism element of the spectrum, and so is Abbott, for that matter. In other words, they're running on gut, feel, the heart, and, uh, and whatever. Um, the, the trick is to try and get a balance to be somewhere near the centre. Now, I would think most people in this room, because of the industries you're in, would be leaning towards the humanist end of this ideology spectrum. And, and that's as it should be. Except I think the need to be somewhere up towards the middle means you keep your feet on the ground and at the same time you know, keep your heart in the right place because rationalism is running by your head and humanism is running by your heart. Uh, God gave them both to us. Um, and what we've been doing, as you can see, is getting more and more educated people not only through universities, but also through Google and everything else that we can possibly think of, meaning that we're becoming more and more rational, and that's doing a, that's creating an enormous amount of pressures, not the least of which is to religions these days, because you know we're starting to use our brain rather than than, than believe some of the stuff we were told. Um, but that rationalism means that most human beings are going to be more rational in their thinking and their behaviour in the future than we've ever been in the past. But because we are flesh and blood, we're also going to be humanists. Getting that balance right, particularly for our community industry, is one of the most important things that I would suggest you're going to have to do. Uh, now, I've been on a charity for the last uh, 18 years or so, and by crikey, um, it, it used to upset me the way top businessmen would come to the board, leave their brains behind and bring their heart. That's the last thing the board needed, for God's sake. I mean, you've got all the people with the heart in the world there. You, if you didn't have a heart, you wouldn't have gone on the board. You know, we need boards to have brains. Uh, and uh, it used to upset me in the early days when I was on the charity I was on to find that, you know, they didn't have enough money, so they'd sack half the staff. And then somebody had died, leave them a house so you could employ some people again. Then they'd run out of money and start all over again. This sort of up, down, up, down was crazy. I said, for God's sake, build up where you've got at least three months full operating expenses in cash in the bank so you don't have to keep firing people all the time, which is cruel to them and cruel to the customers you're trying to look after. So you've got to be pretty rational about some things to be fair to your employees and to the people you're trying to help. And that's what we've now done. We haven't had to sack anybody you know, for the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, well, it gets close sometimes too. So I want to finish on that point just by saying that uh, if we didn't have the right hearts, we wouldn't be in this room. But uh, we're moving into an age where rationalism is going to be important as well. The, the question is how do we get the right balance? I'm going to now perhaps lean towards the, uh, the challenges that I see happening for uh, the NFP. Um, and uh, I'm going to be fairly blunt with a couple of these things, uh, but I mean it in the right way, I hope you can uh, see. Um, first of all, the days of feeling virtuous and having an enterprise that's not for profit, I think are coming to an end. Uh, I'm not saying there's an end to the not-for-profits. I've already projected that it's going to grow faster than the economy over the next five years. So, you know, this sector is not going to in any way diminish. Uh, some bits of it are going to be probably privatised, and I'll come back in a moment, but it's going to be a very fast-growing sector for quite some time. But I really think that the word not-for-profit we, sh we should start to back away from because uh, tax-exempt, that's fine, but profit is a healthy word. We might use a, a euphemism called surpluses. Um, and that's my second point, that the, the not-for-profit sectors need to generate healthy surpluses or profits, pick whatever choice you like, in order to provide cash reserves for the bad times, to invest in intellectual property, to, in other words, to make you smarter, and other vital productivity systems and technologies, and have the wherewithal to expand your activities. And you can't do any of those things if you're living hand-to-mouth with no reserves and not making any surpluses or profits. So, in a sense, um, I would think uh, perhaps the term should be uh, not for sinful profits, 
uh, rather not for profits, okay? Uh, and sinful profits is probably where you're making more than 50% return on your, on your equity. Um, so if you can just stay a little bit below that, uh, I, I think we should call it NFSP, uh, not for sinful profits, okay? Um, because without profits, uh, it's going to be forever a lumbering, you know, mess. Um, I think a number of the not-for-profit industries, incidentally, do need rationalisation. It disturbs me a bit that the charity section of the not-for-profits, and as I've said earlier, that's just under 5% of all the not-for-profit revenue, but in that charity area, the average turnover or revenue of a charity is $800,000 today, and that's only two-thirds of what a 7-Eleven turns over. They turn over about 1.2, 1.4 million, uh, which means I think we've got too many small charities. and. Uh, I think the need for mergers of, of charities is absolutely critical. Uh, it's an area where, of course, we have what you call a founder syndrome. In other words, the founder starts it and then wants to stay there forever, uh, beyond the use-by dates. Um, and uh, they're often too small, uh, and they're, they're stumbling and all the rest of it. All, all at right hearts in the world, but that's where a bit of rationalism's got to come in if you're going to help your clients. Um, I, I mean. I happen to sit on a street kids charity, and um, we, uh, ever since I've been on that board, and I was chairman for two years, I'm not any longer, but um, I was always looking for mergers that we could merge with, you know, in other cities, in other, uh, where we would get some combined economies of scale and help it become a stronger thing, and therefore you could look after more street kids more effectively. And we're going through one of those potential mergers right now. Um, we've already, we did one quite a few years ago, we want to do another one now, and uh, I just think it's a sector that badly needs rationalisation uh, if it's going to really uh, achieve what it needs to do. Uh, productivity improvement incident is dreadful amongst most not-for-profits and it shows up here. These are all the major industries of Australia and you can see where I've got the NFPs, that's where most of the not-for-profits belong. And you can see that all, every one of them are below the national average productivity uh, of, of the last uh, 15 years. Uh, in other words, productivity and modernisation uh, are really desperately needed in this area. And uh, it's one of the very high priorities I would see over the next little while. <coughs> the other charities, just, uh, the other challenges, just to finish off, um, is the first one I call shock horror, but it's probably time to privatise quite a number of the NFPs, starting with universities. Um, <gasps> God, you know. In fact, I spoke to the, all 39 vice chancellors in Canberra a couple of months ago, but I've got to tell you, I had the car running outside the hall. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I'm not that stupid, uh, and uh, but I said no. You know, the time for being these lovely ivory-towered places, where you've got assets coming out your, your, your eyes. You know, there's 50 billion dollars of buildings and land in universities. They only turn over 22 billion. 50. It's, it's the laziest industry I know, apart from uh, well, I can mention one other, but I won't. Uh, and I told them that too. I said, you're really, you're really a property trust more than you are an educational institution. Oh, God, they got mad. Um, but I said, no, the only way to get competition is to start thinking about listing on the stock exchange. And of course, you know, one of the most advanced universities in America is on the stock exchange. It's Phoenix University. Um, and that will happen. I mean, I, I'm a forecaster, and uh, so it will happen. And uh, you, you will start to see... Uh, in fact, the, the one that everybody thinks is an upstart university is the only profitable, well-run university in Australia, and that's the Bond University. They make a healthy profit, you know, 25% of their capital, all the rest of them make about 2%, um, and uh, they run, they completed a degree in two years instead of three, because they run three semesters a year instead of two. Most universities only work for, you know, five months, six months of the year. All those assets, late, lying idle, not only should they be working three semesters, they should be working night shift as well, you know. And, <laughs> And then a university degree is not going to cost you 15 grand a year, it's going to cost you four, which is what it should be today. So, you know, if anything needs a bomb under it, it's universities. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that we, there are some areas badly in need of a big, big shake-up. Um, we do need competition in the not-for-profit sector too, as well as strategic alliances, which we've got in many cases, and we do need the collegiality. I mean, you're not going to get a bunch, nicer bunch of people in this room than you, we've got here today. Being aware of world's best practice in the area in which you're operating, whether it be educational, health, or, or schools, or whatever, uh, I think is, is, is not a delete option anymore. And finally, I just want to say that there is still a lot of government services that could be outsourced to efficient not-for-profits. Um, and, uh, but I think you've got to earn that right by being highly productive, highly innovative, um, and with economies of scale. Once you've got that, I think uh, being ready to take on a huge number of services that are conducted by, 
by straight governments today is, is going to be available to you. I'm going to finish now that it's 10 past one with one last slide. Um, I said I'd take a long time. <laughs> Never invited again. Um, if you can say yes to these 12, 12 golden rules, you're going to be running a first class business or whatever you want to call it, organisational. And I, I'm not in the interest of time going to spend too much time except to say the best businesses in Australia or the world do a few things. Like, first of all, stay in one business at a time. Don't try and do too many things. It's like marriage. Just stick with one at a time. You know, uh, or serial monogamy, I think, is the other term if you're not married. But um, uh, it, truly, it's hard enough to make one thing work without trying to take on two or threes. And sometimes in charities, I've seen them take on too many different spheres of activity. Uh, and other not-for-profits the same, whether it's in health or whatever, don't try and be good at too many things. It's too hard in this day and age. Secondly, aim to dominate what you're in. Uh, you might say, oh, gee, that's a bit tough, you know, if you're talking about not-for-profits. Nothing wrong with that, because uh, you've got to be unique uh, in your own field. Um, and that means you've got to dominate in the sense that you're the best at it, and it's very clear that you're the best, and then the rest have to catch up with you. Being forever innovative is rule number three. Uh, you cannot have a successful organisation today without thinking about how can I change doing what I'm doing to make it smarter, better and more efficient. Uh, and so, so important. I think that and incidentally number 11 are, are probably two of the most important ones to worry about in this day and age, and I'll come to that in a sec, and that's uh, organisational culture. Outsource non-core activities, even for not-for-profits. It doesn't make any sense to do an awful lot of things. I mean, you can outsource everything from canteens and whatever you want to. Don't own hard assets, uh, and we don't in my charity. We don't, you should never own buildings or equipment. It all should be leased. Have good and professional financial management. Oh, oh, oh how critical is that? A plan from the outside in, which is why you have conferences like this, because you're hearing a lot of outside speakers, give you some perspective. I hope I've given you a bit today too. Anticipate any new industry life cycle changes, and I won't bore you with that, but sometimes industries do go through a completely new rebirth, and that happens in health and all sorts of things. Follow world's best practice, I've already suggested that. Develop strategic alliances, I've mentioned that too in passing. Number 11 is develop a unique organisational culture. Now, as we all know, slavery's been banned, uh, and many of us object to that because it used to be much easier to control them when we you know, owned them. Um, but that's gone, and um, no, I'm joking. What you can own is not the people, and no, no, we should. What you can own is the culture that makes your employees want to, employees want to turn up all every day with a smile on their face and to tell their friends this is a great place to work. And so if I had to pick out two on that list that are particularly important in this day and age, it would be innovation and unique organisational culture. And finally, of course, we do need leadership. We've needed it for thousands and thousands of years. And leadership comes before management. You need management, otherwise the place just doesn't run efficiently. Without leadership, you've got no direction and no real future. So I'm gonna finish on that point by wishing you the best of leadership the best of innovation and the best in looking after employees. Thank you for listening.